következő panelunk témája a gyógyászati kanabisz jogi helyzete. Két előadónk lesz, dr. Pavel Pachta és Tomasz Zabrinski. Dr. Pavel, dr. Pavel Pachta az előadását a kanabisz gyógyászati használata törvényhozás és szabályozási kérdések címmel fogja megtartani. Dr. Pachta közgazdász, a Nemzetközi Drogszabályozás szakértője. Több mint két évtizeden át az ENSZ drogpolitikával foglalkozó szerveinél töltött be különböző pozíciókat. 2004 és 2013 között az ENSZ kábítószerügyi egyezményeinek betartásáért felelős International Narcotics Control Board helyettes titkára volt. Dr. Pachta számos ENSZ és WHO kiadványban működött közre, melyek a nemzetközi ellenőrzés alatt álló anyagokról és az orvosi és tudományos célból történő hozzáférésükről szóltak. Az előadását a gyógyászati kanabisz törvényhozás és szabályozásai kérdéseiről tartja. Thank you, madam, and uh, I would also like to thank very much the organizers for inviting me to this conference. Uh, to your country, which has uh, such an important history in international drug control and which is so important as far as uh, development of pharmaceutical industry is concerned. So I think it's excellent that uh, uh, we are meeting here in this country also to discuss the issue of uh, medical use of cannabis. Now, uh, I would like to try to help you uh, to look at these issues uh, a bit from a different perspective. Uh, you know, we are discussing the issue, the cannabis is helping people with their medical problems. Uh, on the other hand, uh, cannabis is not allowed to be prescribed in the vast majority of countries. Uh, even in many countries, it is not possible to do research with cannabis or it's very difficult. So why is the situation like, like this? So uh, I would like to look at it from the point of view of the, uh, you know, those who will have to authorize and uh, allow this medical use from the point of view of your uh, competent authorities or from national regulatory authorities in various countries. And I would like to say that uh, these authorities have in front of them a certain dilemma. The, to allow the medical use of cannabis, it is a dilemma for them. The first you know, let's discuss uh, those aspects which may bring them to authorize, which would be like the arguments for, let's go into this medical cannabis. Well, first of all, it was mentioned already here that uh, some people are self-medicating. So sick people are using for treatment cannabis obtained from black market on from illegal cultivation. I don't know how many are those people in Hungary or whether there has been any research on that in Hungary. Probably there is some uh, anecdotal information. Uh, recently in the United Kingdom, they published results of an investigation. They were saying perhaps one quarter to one third of all people who are illicitly cultivating cannabis are doing this in some way uh, for the uh, medical needs because they need cannabis or are using cannabis for medical purposes. And also investigations from other countries indicate the same. So Czech Republic, for example, my country of origin is the country where it is uh, very frequent that people do something like that. So definitely for the competent authorities, it must be extremely embarrassing that they people have to violate the law, are in fact violating the law, when they want to obtain their medicine, and by the same time, what they are getting from uh, the black market. Are you sure about the safety of this medicine? Are you sure about the efficacy of that? You are not. So your people are taking for medical purpose something which might be even you know, unsafe, and in fact not efficacy. They pay for it. So the second point, we have to go quickly. Uh, what might be an argument for that, for the competent authorities? Increasing body of evidence about efficacy, safety of cannabis as medicine. 
The predecessors have mentioned it. The medical doctors have mentioned it. I will not speak about it. I remember uh, um, uh, Professor Hanush saying last week uh, that every week there are published 50 to 100 scientific papers regarding cannabis and cannabinoids. Every week additional 50 to 100 papers. So this body of knowledge is increasing and is indicating that cannabis uh, is useful for many indications. And the third argument for when the competent authorities will be thinking, should we allow, should we not allow, is the fact that already several countries have already succeeded to make legal medical cannabis available to patients. So this is always a strong argument for you. Your neighbor has it already. So you know, probably is something on it. So, so let's try also. So let's have a look. And I try to put together from different sources information on the number of patients who can get legally cannabis uh, within different uh, medical cannabis programs around the world. It's not easy to get this information, so these are somewhat information I consider uh, most appropriate, most correct. And uh, uh, I would say for some countries I took more conservative estimates. So as you can see, we have here, you know, United States of America. You know that today in 25 states of the United States of America and in the uh, District of Columbia, medical cannabis is possible, um, allowed. Uh, the last state just recently was, I think, Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken. So 25 states where they have national medical cannabis programs in the United States. In this table, we have data from the organization which is indicated as a source. And in this table, you can see that we have information from 21 states and from District of Columbia, uh, because in those 21 states and Washington was uh, the system functioning at the beginning of this year. So they got data more or less as of uh, the end of last year. 1,246,000 people in, the, in these states are getting cannabis in these programs. The second column in this slide is indicating, for comparison purposes, uh, the number of these uh, patients getting cannabis legally per 1,000 residents. So you can see the average for the United States, like eight people per 1,000 are getting cannabis for uh, medical purposes. But just below that, you can see this big difference in the United States. They have two types of pro pro medical cannabis programs. They have quite liberal medical cannabis programs in the west of the country, California and so on, Colorado. And then you can see, for example, in Colorado, the number of these uh, patients is like 19.8, so almost 20 people per 1,000 residents are medical cannabis patients, are allowed to take cannabis uh, as their medicine. Uh, on the other hand, there are states mainly in the east, like uh, I have here, for example, Minnesota. So it, th there, the involvement of patients in strictly controlled medical cannabis programs is rather small. So you see in Minnesota is much less. On the average in the US, 8.1. USA started with the medical cannabis programs in 1996 in California. Let's look Israel, we have heard uh, Dr. Ilyal Resnik from Israel today. So this is a country with uh, a lot of experience in medical cannabis. At the end of last year, around 25,000 people getting cannabis. It's about three per 1,000 residents in Israel. And then Canada has already a lot of experience, 1.2. I really am limited by time. So please, this is the slide. This gives some of this information. You will find Netherlands, you know, very famous in Europe for this medical cannabis programs from 2003. But my a bit optimistic estimate, 4,500 people getting it uh, uh, from pharmacies uh, would indicate like only 0.3. Of course, in uh, Netherlands, they have their coffee shops. Some of them get their medicines st still from the illegal, or quasi illegal, or uh, you know, uh, uh, from, from coffee shops. So not uh, really uh, medical cannabis from pharmacies. Czech Republic, Italy started recently. Uh, Dr. Zabranski will talk about Czech Republic. So 
I will not. But you can see Germany is preparing a very important, I think, program in medical cannabis for 2007 to 2009. It is now for approval. That will be really very important testing of medical use of cannabis. They will be cultivating in Germany. So I think it will be very useful. And then other countries joining recently, Australia, Chile, Colombia. So uh, we have mentioned, we have come back from Macedonia. Other countries are joining and establishing their national cannabis programs. Now, is this, for example, for the United States of America, eight per 1,000 residents, is it too much? Is it too low? Who knows? Uh, I'm not a medical doctor. It's difficult for me. What I would like to compare, I'm comparing here. Look at this slide. This is a slide which is based on the information governments report to the International Narcotics Control Board. This is the consumption of opioids controlled under Narcotics Convention of opioids uh, in the world. And I put some of these countries which uh, have medical cannabis program. I put also Hungary here. And you see how many people in these countries are getting uh, strictly controlled opioids uh, per thousand of residents in those countries. So in the United States of America, 50 people are getting uh, uh, opioids, while only eight medical cannabis in these 21 states. In Canada, which is known for the medical cannabis program, 31 are getting opioids, uh, three are getting, uh, no, Canada, uh, one, one person is getting, getting uh, uh, medical cannabis. Uh, you know, uh, this wants to say that uh, sometimes we are very careful about you know, how cannabis should be controlled and that's a substance which we have to take very carefully. On the other hand, on the other hand we have a large consumption of strictly con controlled opioids, for example. If you look at the next table, I put here uh, anxiolytics, sedative hypnotics, some countries report already to the International Narcotics Control Board on their consumption. Your country is uh, an important consumer of all these countries. So uh, cannabis can be also used, we have heard from the doctors, uh, as a hypnotic, as a sedative, as an anxiolytic, perhaps could substitute for some of these control substances. So, Sometimes governments are not so much afraid that they consume already so much controlled anxiolytics, but if they would con consume a bit of uh, you know, cannabis as an anxiolytic, uh, they might be concerned. So this is only you know, to, to, to think of it, that uh, situation is like that. Well, let's go again back to the competent authorities. Imagine that you are in a competent authorities. And uh, what would be the arguments against immediately, you know, what comes in your mind if you are somewhere in the ministry and deciding should I approve, should I be for cannabis, medical cannabis project or not? The first issue I think would come to your mind is medical cannabis, would it be a Trojan horse for legalization of a recreational use, of recreational use of cannabis? Well, I think we have to treat all these two issues extremely separate. You know, it's a medical cannabis is a standalone issue. I think it would be totally unfair to uh, take like patients, people who need something for their treatment, as hostages for an ideology. For example, for an ideology, I want to have recreational use of cannabis. Or on the other hand, I do not want to allow. So I think these two issues should be, should be taken totally separately. And if I follow the countries which I have seen, so especially in Europe, there is no impact of the medical cannabis program on the discussion whether there should be recreational use, should not be recreational use. Perhaps Mr. Zabransky can speak better about the Czech Republic later, but my personal opinion is that the fact that we have medical use of cannabis in the Czech Republic has not added any additional arguments to those who want recreational use and has not added any additional arguments to those who are against recreational use. So please, this should be kept totally as a separate issue, in my opinion, and uh, patients should not be taken as hostages. Now, sometimes people are afraid of international drug laws. Are they against the medical use of cannabis? 
no, uh, you know, your government will not violate any law, any international provision if your government allows for medical use of cannabis uh, herb or if your government allows for medical use of cannabis extracts. Uh, again, we have very limited time, but this is the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. This convention controls about 180 different narcotics, and you will find first schedule. This is the most of the narcotics are in this first schedule. And you can see there is cannabis, there is cannabis resin, extracts, tinctures of cannabis, and there is, of course, cocaine, heroin, opium, methadone, fentanyl, many other substances are there. They are con considered like standard narcotics for which standard control system should apply. Schedule two, you have some narcotics which are considered less dangerous, like codeine, a bit less strict can, uh, system can be applied. Schedule three, preparations containing very tiny quantities. You do not have to control them very much, but you have schedule four, and in schedule four, you can find again cannabis, as in schedule one, again cannabis resin, and a very few other substances. Uh, one we everybody know is heroin, you know, so you can find in scale for cannabis, cannabis resin, etorphine, uh, heroin, theofentanil, and some others. Uh, what does the convention says about the substances in scale four? So they are not only in scale one, they are also in scale four. Well, they are considered as have, being particularly dangerous, having dangerous properties, and lacking therapeutic value. So this is like the convention in 1961, and it was prepared in the 50s on the basis of the knowledge of the time uh, was concluded to place cannabis in that schedule. Now, and what the convention sh says what the government should do? Well, government should consider the situation in the country, and if it is necessary, government may prohibit the pro pro production, manufacture, possession, use of those substances, but doesn't have to. So, uh, conclusion, uh, cannabis is included in scale one and four, but convention uh, leaves it to the governments, you know, so each government can decide. It is at the discretion of government of each country. If you allow, you are not violating. If you prohibit, you are also not violating the convention. Uh, so this is with cannabis herb. Now, if you look at extracts, you know, what you call sometimes cannabis oil, so even in 1961, they were not suggesting to prohibit the use of cannabis extracts. They left them only in scale one. They are not in scale four. Cannabis tinctures, cannabis extracts are in scale one of the 61 convention. So prohibition was even not suggested at that time. So please, international law should be no obstacle for the medical use of cannabis. Uh, the control organ, uh, which is more or less controlling how governments are implementing the conventions, is the International Narcotics Control Board. INCB published uh, such an important statement, basic statement on cannabis in, two, in its report for 2014. You can read it here. Well, we do not have too much time, but what is important, first line, uh, a uh, single convention allows to use cannabis for medical purposes. INCB confirmed that you can apply certain regulations, you know, like you do, for example, for opium poppy if you cultivate. Your country has a lot of experience how to control cultivation of opium poppy. So definitely uh, your authorities would also be able very well to control cultivation of, for example, cannabis. So INCB confirms it's possible. Now. Uh, it is important also to say cannabis in this scale four, and the convention is saying should be, uh, you know, should perhaps uh, 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 be authorized, not authorized. There are more and more requests for reconsidering this status of cannabis. INCB told uh, WHO, please make a new review of cannabis. There was also once in, uh, uh, in Commission on Narcotics Draft, make a new review of cannabis. Because people say in WHO that the latest scientific review was done in 1935, you know, where really experts look at it. So last session of the expert committee on drug abuse, uh, uh, on drug dependence of WHO was in, uh, was in November last year. And they put in the report that they will start collecting data 
for a review in the future. You know? So even the WHO is now coming slowly to that, that they will be preparing this review because of these many people saying, many requests saying, even governments and international bodies, perhaps this scale of four is not correct. Now, I'm coming to the third dilemma or third argument against, which the consortiums may say, and this is we have heard together uh, to do, to, today already, cannabis herb is not an approved medicine. Well, we have a few, and sorry, I apologize, I have to exclude this. So we, we have a few, we have a few uh, uh, can, uh, products based on cannabis and based on cannabinoids, which are approved medicine. We have heard the names of them, Sativex. Huh? We have heard the name of Marinol. So Sativex, this is a product which was by the regulatory authority in the UK confirmed for the treatment of spasticity for MS. You know, uh, you, we have heard Marinol synthetic THC was registered in the United States. So, so there are some registered medicines, yeah, but not the cannabis herb. So what about the cannabis herb? And we know that we have countries which have medical cannabis programs with herb. It needs somewhat a proactive action by governments. You know, I would say proactive action of governments because you have special treatment programs, you have compassionate use programs also for other not registered medicines. And what I really like is this and I will be finishing uh, shortly. This, if you open the website of the uh, Ministry of Health of Israel, of their cannabis agency, so you will find this slide, and they are saying, medical cannabis is not registered as medicine, and its efficacy and safety when used for medical purposes has not yet been established. Nevertheless, there is evidence that cannabis could help patients suffering from certain medical conditions and alleviate their suffering. The Ministry of Health wishes to remove obstacles to the supply of this drug to patients who could benefit from it medically. So you see this proactive approach in Israel. They know it can help. They know we do not know yet everything, but it can definitely help. So they themselves try to remove obstacles. And as we heard from our colleague, doctor from Israel, they are still very strict. They are checking that it is not misused. So when the country is then establishing the programs, Many important factors are in play, range of products, prices of products, access to prescribers, comfortability of delivery, and of course, knowledge. Knowledge of doctors, number one, patients, growers. But anyway, if you want, uh, you can do it, you can, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for uh, this clarifying uh, presentation about the legal implications and also providing answers to the dilemmas or uh, arguments that, uh, that uh, health authorities may make. Um, és akkor most uh, mennyit nem újra a lehetőséget arra, hogy kérdezni lehessen dr. Pachtától. Rengeteg tapasztalattal rendelkezik, úgyhogy um, megkérném azt, hogy akinek van kérdése, azt jelezze, ezt viszünk mikrofont, és, uh, és a nevét, illetve a, a szervezetet, amit képvisel, hogyha van ilyen, akkor mondja. For me, yeah? uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Professor Ur. Even, even that the lecturer is an old time friend for at least 25, 30 years. Pavel, that was very interesting. I, I learned also quite a bit because I haven't analyzed the whole context in this detail. But, and you do, you do know that I am not a great friend of WHO in recent time, I haven't been. But for the credit of WHO, I want to mention that I was part of a detailed review in two sessions of a scientific committee, maybe three. But I cannot tell you the year. The report must be present in WHO library, or I may have a copy of it. Yet the politics came in like with the COCA review. You remember the WHO COCA in review, what happened to it? 
Good. There was a given country who, who actually drowned it. Now, something similar may have happened to it, but it would be very useful to have access to it, also to the organizers to see what came out, because that has changed quite a bit of the old 35 or whatever review, obviously. Science has progressed so much, but we had made real effort to reevaluate the status of cannabis, and I know that the, the present review is ongoing, and there is already some reports maybe available on the internet. I have one of them, and that is all important to, to see where to go and how WHO, what position WHO may take. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yeah, no. Okay. Um, it one uh, I would have a question. Um, as some cannabinoids don't have psychoactive effect at all, Excellent. like uh, CBD or some others. Uh, they are uh, in current state uh, registered, uh, or no, they are not registered, but they are under investigation in uh, drug trials, so they are investigational products. Is there any regulation uh, whether there is a possibility, uh, so whether, uh, are they treated as cannabis or are they treated separately? And uh, my question uh, would be, how is possible to include them into compassionate use program? What is the regulation for compassionate use program of those uh, cannabinoids which don't have psychoactive effect at all? Can I? Yeah. Thank you for this question. I think it's a very good question. I'm happy that you, you, you raised this question because it's important to mention. You know, this is a very limited time, and I have shown you one convention, the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. Under this convention, cannabis herb is scheduled, cannabis is scheduled, uh, cannabis tinctures, uh, cannabis extracts, and also cannabis resin. But if you look at the active ex uh, ingredient of cannabis, which is uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, and if you look, for example, on delta tetrahydrocannabinol, it's not controlled under the 61 convention, but it's controlled under the 1971 convention on psychotropic substances. It's included in schedule two of that convention, and the control regime for those substances is slightly is required by the convention to be slightly less strict like for narcotic drugs. So it's allowed for medical use. Delta 9 THC can be allowed for medical use. Now, what about CBD? You will not find CBD at all uh, under the 1971 convention. So CBD itself is not a control substance and uh, has nothing to do with international drug control. So if you will be basing something on pure CBD, there is no requirement from the International Drug Control Treaties to con control it. Something else might be if you will have an extract, you know, if you will have an extract. Now, my personal opinion is if you will have an extract which contains only CBD or which is purified to a certain degree that uh, there is only a um, small, very small level, uh, some kind of uh, now, very small levels of THC. So, in my opinion, it's also not a control substance. This, is, this should not be controlled under the 61 Convention as an extract because it contains CBD. Why we are controlling? Because of the, uh, uh, of the, of the um, properties of THC. And if this doesn't contain THC, in important uh, 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 quantities has no reason to be controlled. If it's a mixture like Cetivex, that it controls some extract containing THC and an extract containing CBD, then of course I would understand this should be controlled in accordance to the 61 Convention. For your next question regarding, uh, you know, uh, compassionate, that uh, I, I cannot help you at this point. I would do it at the national level according to your national rules. Yeah. Uh, does European law applies to Hungarian law or does or whether anybody knows whether Hungary has a separate regulation or only the EU uh, regulation is uh, valid? Uh, if I understand the question properly, you know, the UN uh, 
legislation or the UN treaties, they have been agreed by all governments. Also, Hungarian government is party to the treaty. And it's like uh, uh, the minimum of requirements you have to apply. So each country should apply at least as the lowest standard the requirements of the treaty. However, the country can in addition have some additional control requirements. This can uh, do any country. This is allowed. This is your national decision. Yes, but does anybody know uh, knows what is the current situation in Hungary for CBD, for example? Uh -huh. So I hope the Hungarians will help us. I uh, have heard, but it will be better. Thank you. I, I know that uh, here in Hungary it is legal to have CBD. Yeah. So you have, uh, you have uh, industrial hemp which contains CBD and you can grow that. And there is a place you get a permission to collect the, the buds of the industrial hemp which contains CBD. So that's what I know. Um, and we will have a panel. Do you hear me? So we will have a panel in, panel in the afternoon uh, precisely about the Hungarian uh, regulations. So if there, are any more, if there are no more questions to Dr. Pachta, then I would uh, like to introduce uh, our new presenter, Dr. Tomasz Zabrinski. Um, a gyógyászati kanabisz engedélyezésének folyamata Csehországban címmel fog beszélni. Dr. Zabrinski, aki számos kutatás és fejlesztési projekt résztvevője a Prágai Károly Egyetem adiktológiai tanszékén, és saját kutatói és tanácsadói vállalatát vezeti. A Cseh miniszterelnök drogpolitikai tanácsadója és a Cseh egészségügyi miniszter gyógyászati kanabiszért felelős szószólója. Jelenleg az International Cannabis and Cannabinoids Institute vezető kutatója, és az előadását a Cseh modellről tartja. Thank you. And welcome. And thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be in this nice city and to share the experience we have. Uh, and it's also great to hear, I'm new, I mean, it, my wife would never believe. Uh, so uh, first, uh, let me acknowledge the co-authors. Uh, Professor Tomáš Zima, who's now the rector of the Charles University in Prague, and uh, uh, Dr. Lenka Teska Arnoštová, who's the vice minister for legal affairs of the Czech Ministry of Health. Uh, which tells you a little bit about where we are with the medical cannabis in the Czech Republic now. It's no more seen as controversial issue in terms of should we do it or not. However, there's still a lot of questions open how we should do it. And uh, so let me show you how the country where Franz Kafka was born has dealt with it. Uh, my four speaker, Lumir Hanush, basically preempted half of my presentation uh, with the history. I like him still. <laughs> However, there are some photos with my pre in my presentation which you won't find in the web version later, like this one. <laughs> this will be deleted. Uh, However, if you look then later on the website of the presentation, on the top of what Lumir has shown, there's a list of uh, references, uh, uh, which are usually open access or they are being uh, open by the journal, so it might be of some help to you to look through it. Um, so. I won't speak about how much the university which I am alumni of and Lumir is alumni of uh, has been novel and advantages and you know uh, very early in the uh, cannabis research. I will tell you more about the politics and policy of medical cannabis in the in the Czech Republic. Um, similarly, like Hungary, uh, we share the history of being part of what. Uh, labeled itself as 
countries of peace and happiness. Uh, in 1990, the communism was somehow overthrown. Oh, 1989, late 1989. And since then, some of the previous taboos were actually more open and more public. This was the case of the Czech Republic. Uh, already in early 90s, there have been like isolated uh, newspaper articles, news, etc., reporting about autotherapy of patients for certain illnesses with wild or illegal cannabis. Uh, the first research proper survey being uh, covering the question actually what's the number of people who ever did use cannabis for autotherapeutic purposes. As you can see, this is only seven years ago, done by, by the National Focal Point on, drug monit on monitoring the drug situation that high. This is basically a vast majority of people having at least one experience with cannabis in my country. And the, as you can expect, the profiles or the typical profile of those people is quite different from the recreational users. So they are much older, they are pretty much uh, in a, a, a I would say, in, in, in established social situation, etc. More on this uh, uh, later or other in, in, in a reference. Uh, this person was quite important for changing the image of using the cannabis for medical purposes. His name was Josef Ponikowski. He was a sufferer. He was suffering uh, with a Parkinson disease. And, and he was extremely open in telling the media and anyone interested, he was a very like, communicative person, what he is doing, why he is doing it, how long he is doing it, and how it does help, and, um, as well as his relatives. So this was widely covered by the media, by the TVs, by the most popular journals, etc. And it started to be like well-established topics for the media, which was an important shift, actually, uh, for, for the debate. It took some more time. There were several attempts how to make the medical cannabis a political or legal issue, most of them uh, unsuccessful, also because there was uh, lacking uh, political support. So in 2010, uh, in April 8th, um, there was the parliamentary seminar on medical cannabis, which was then being run under the patronage of then the dean of the medical faculty, who's, again, co-authoring this presentation, and the then minister of interior. However, he has a background of medical doctor and lawyer, uh, Ivan Langer. So those two share the patronage. Uh, they've been speakers, some of you, you've already seen or see. Uh, they were also people like uh, Deputy Ministers of Health, Deputy Minister of Interior, Head of the National Drug Squad of Police, the Head of Food and Drugs Administration, Czech Republic, etc., etc., and the discussion went very well. Uh, the consensus uh, and uh, actually the, the record of this is available on the YouTube, but uh, in Czech only. Uh, there is a consensus of all the people involved, including the Ministry of Health in that time, that there is a need to provide legal supply of cannabis for patients who are diagnosed to use it according with EBM, which is the abbreviation for evidence-based medicine. Uh, okay, that, that was 8th April. Uh, however, the same Ministry of Health who said this or signed this uh, developed no activity within the next year. A uh, few photos, you know that guy, that's the guy who stole my presentation. Uh, that was the head of the FDA, you know this bald head probably. And uh, this is the chief of the uh, Institute for the Prevention of Crime and Related Social Issues, I think is the proper. Uh, um, 
And this seminar took part in the parliament uh, in a hall which was lended to us, the organizers, I was involved. Uh, by the parliament, it was the hall for something like two, no, 180 people. We ended up in 320 and then we closed the door. So, so there was co quite a, uh, unexpected, to some extent, interest. This was the head of the uh, association of multiple sclerosis association of patients who are treating them themselves with medical cannabis illegally. That was the the name, uh, a very brave person. Uh, uh, once again, the theft of my presentation. Uh, and here, another look into the, into, the, uh, into the audience. Okay, so, and again, the guy. So, so, so then we had another year, no activity from the Ministry of Health, who would be a logical, uh, Okay, executive part of, of the society responsible for making this actually a reality. So, so uh, um, after a year in 2011, then Dean, now rector of the Ch of the Charles University, then Dean of the of the medical faculty, actually asked the Minister of Health. Okay, so we had a meeting, which I was actually uh, a patron of, where we are in this. Uh, the answer was rather bizarre. Once again, the dean of the first medical faculty, who's one of the most established scientists in his field of biochemistry, is asking his Minister of Health where we are, and the Minister of Health says, nowhere, because nobody is interested. I was looking at it, asking my dean, okay, so you are probably not interested, even if you are sending a letter Strange. Uh, however, that was, that was again uh, where we were, and the situation seemed to be in rather a dead end. Like, okay, if the ministry is not interested, what can we do? However, here again, the NGOs, and specifically the associations of patients and activists being quite interested in, in the life of the patients were really emailing, asking, trying to meet in person, etc., etc. so that in May, uh, a group of people, which I had the privilege to somehow coordinate, decided to try as one of the least possible ways uh, to put together a petition. Uh, in the petition committee, and that was probably important, uh, there was a number of deans and ex-deans of medical faculties. I mean, the former, uh, then dean of the medical faculty in Olomouc, the dean of the medical faculty in Prague, form, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Other scientists, Lumir Andrei Hanusz being one of them, uh, patients, et cetera. It was the 12th of the, of the committee. Uh, it was... Uh, published in the August 2011 with extremely swift reaction of this person who was then extremely important actually for the process. That was the head of the lower chamber of the Czech parliament, the right center party, uh, Miss Nemcova, who actually called me after she saw me on the TV asking what can I do? So can we meet? Uh, so we met the next day, uh, making long story short, uh, they, uh, she actually made the Prime Minister to establish a speci special expert committee whose task was to prepare the legislation which the Ministry of Health actually refused to prepare, which somehow uh, created a special relationships with, between the medical cannabis um, activists and petition and the law and then Minister of Health, as you can imagine, because it was seen as uh, trying to jump over his head, which was actually true. Uh, however, it also somehow marked the support of the high-level politicians, including the Prime Minister. Uh, the head of the 
uh, of the WER group was again now director of the of the Charles University, Professor Zima. This is uh, the head of the National Drug Commission, and you know that guy. Uh, so they've been two subgroups, one of them being medical, the other one being legal. Uh, each of them being led by this very sufficient manager, Professor Zima, being tasked with very, with very like really uh, uh, expressed tasks, which you can, uh, which you can see here. At the end, we had a supportive, actually, uh, 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 statements of the Society for Neurology, for Oncology, Algesiology, which is the treatment of, treatment of pain, ophthalmology, dermatology, infectology, geriatry, and a very specific uh, society of hospital-based pharmacologists, which was my first time I ever heard about them. Uh, and did a review of the scientific literature, uh, which was not that different from what you've heard uh, from, from Lumir and also uh, Dr. Resnik, uh, et cetera. Uh, the legal group reviewed different legal models, Israeli one, Canadian, as it was in that time, Austrian, as it was in that time, Spain, with it, which its medical cannabis clubs, Netherlands, etc. At the end, after two months, we had something like a very uh, exhaustive and, and very uh, mm, large reviews. And within another one and a half months, by December 21, uh, the proposal was sent to the parliament, number of members of the parliament, throughout actually all the parties, from the, well, let's say right, Christian Democrats to communists, which was my first and last time I ever negotiated with communists. No, that was my, not my the first, the first was 1989. So far it was the last time I negotiated with communists. However, we had two communists in these nine people who uh, put the, the proposal of the law forward. Uh, there was a little bit of fights with the Minister of Health who was against it and tried to the government to block it, not very uh, uh, successfully. Importantly, uh, the whole law was being prepared explicitly and also in the content in accord with the UN treaties and specifically with the UN treaty of 1961 as it was covered by uh, Dr. Pachta. Uh, so we established the National Cannabis Agency as the, as the single treaty is requiring us, etc. Uh, so we had these nine members of the parliament, I told you already, two of them, uh, one of them being a communist actually. Uh, there we have like this two chamber parliament, so the House of Commons, the lower chamber, approved it by 126 votes of 154, in other words, constitutional majority. And the same, even more overwhelming, over hell, even bigger support we actually had in the in the Senate, which is the upper chamber. So at the end, if this if we would need a constitutional law, we would have it. Uh, but uh, that was not the case. By February 15, it was signed by the president. Probably the last law being signed by then President Klaus, and it came into the force uh, by March uh, 1st, 2013. That was the law. However, the Minister of Health then, whose name was Lubos Heger, was still in his chair. He didn't succeed to block the law in the legal or parliamentary level, which is under strict public control. However, by the bylong arms, which are not actually under democratic control, these are very much like internal process within the, within the ministries and the government, he, to make long story short, he succeeded to replace the legal prohibition by economic prohibition. And also by what I would say a non-scientific prohibition. So there, 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 uh, there was published the law, not very much based on the evidence, um, 
putting limits for like 30 grams per month per person. Question of the experts, why? The answer, because we think it's right. You said, okay, but this is actually not very much based on the evidence. Anyway, it stayed there, and there have been other uh, 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 provisions which basically blocked the whole law. So instead of, as the bylaw norms are expected to, to make the law working, we had a law which was emptied by the bylaw norms uh, in that time. Um, the, there was this a little, a little monopoly of the Dutch company Bedrocan, nothing against them, they are great guys, but every monopoly sucks. <laughs> Sorry for not being diplomatic. Uh, there was the prohibition of uh, using the cannabis for persons younger than 18, etc., etc. Um, we also had uh, another prohibition by another bylaw norm saying insurance companies are not allowed to cover the medical cannabis no matter what they feel about it. So that was actually in a quick view where we were in 2013, then we had two changes of the government in 2014. A new minister uh, arrived from the left, left center, the Social Democrats, and because of some strange reason, because I never voted for the Social Democrats, he hired me at, as his special envoy for the drug policy and uh, medical cannabis. Since then, we are working on trying uh, somehow to change these bylaw norms, to do it in accord with the rules, it's much more difficult than to do it not in accord with the rules, as it was done before, so it took some time. Uh, we also tried to overcome the, the, the aloof approach of medical doctors, which is normal. I mean, this is not the first new or novel treatment I'm somehow trying to, to help to to implement, it was the same with the substitution treatment for opioid dependence in late 90s. It's, it's always very difficult. I mean, people are afraid of being proponents of a treatment which has been illegal until very recently, right? I mean, A, it somehow smells differently than the standard treatments. B, there's no experience. I mean, I mean, the whole medical profession is being based on the experience. There's a lot of theory, et cetera, et cetera, but at the end, the training is you go, you see the clinical work, you shadow your whatever resident, then you are allowed to work under his supervision, then you are allowed to work on your own. If there's no resident experience in, in, in the treatment, okay, you'd rather don't do this. Uh, and there was basically no institutional body uh, which would be either tasked or even authorized to provide trainings or education in the field. Meanwhile, several things happened. I told you we are working for almost two years on establishing the bylaw norms. So we have a, a, we have a first domestic grower, which is much cheaper than the imported Dutch cannabis. Right now it's about three euro per gram of the medical cannabis, and there's expected this as more domestic growers arrive, the price will go even lower, and as we have more patients. Uh, in the new bylaw norm, most of what I feel non-evidence-based provisions were removed, the only one which I would love to see being removed, but not our pediatricians, is the age limit of 18. Um, there was a little bit of discussion between the neurologists slash epileptologists and the pediatricians. Pediatricians won, but I think this is not the end of the fight. I hope so. Uh, we have a lifting of the ban of coverage of the medical cannabis by the insurance companies very recent, about one month ago but this doesn't say they should cover. So, so we are, so that's yet, there are now, now, now actually the insurance companies have their say and it won't be easy, but we somehow moved forward and, and we see what we'll, um, we, are, we already started to negotiate with few, uh, with the biggest medical uh, insurance company uh, and the other two and uh, 
Well, I would say I'm the mixed pessimistic optimistic as always in this case. Uh, we have research grounds on the clinical trials uh, being applied to the, to the proper agencies uh, waiting for the response. Um, I mean, th this is a very confidential procedure, so we know very little actually what, what are the approaches of the people who are responsible for uh, the scoring. Okay, quick overview. Uh, about the Czech situation. We have, since November 2015, the change of the blocking bylaw norm. So, so to say, now we have the maximum monthly amount, 180 grams per month per patient. This is mostly for people who are expected to benefit from preparations being made magistral iter from the herbal cannabis, such as extract, etc., and then people who would use herbal cannabis itself. Uh, we have the age limit. We have the order uh, being lifted. We have the Czech cannabis, which is about one-third of the cannabis, uh, of the Dutch price of the cannabis, and we expect to, to go even lower. We applied for a special sub-society of the Czech Medical Society, which, would, which is called now the Czech Medical Society for Treatment with Medical Cannabis and its research of the Czech Medical Society of Jan Evangelista Purkinje. Uh, waiting for the appraisal or uh, the comments of the presidency of this Czech Medical Society, which is responsible for, the among other things, for the education in the field. I mean, all of this is being done specifically because we feel we need a long, lifelong education, how to treat, how to deal with the medical cannabis for the medical professionals, doctors and medical nurses. For more than a year, we negotiate with um, uh, Israeli government and quite recently with Israeli Med Medical Association, Dr. Leonid Eidelman, about providing the training to the Czech doctors right now the preliminary term is uh, September for 20 medical professionals who should learn from the Israeli experience. The main message, okay, uh, that's because I said there's no golden bullet, but then I looked to the internet and I saw golden bullet actually there. I, I somehow blared the producer of this, but this is called the golden bullet pipe, and I don't think it's for tobacco. Um, However, in the medical cannabis policy, I think, being in since 2008 probably, and, and, and traveling around the world, there's nothing like a golden bullet. I mean, there's, there's no good policy which would solve all the problems you face. What seems to me, is looking to Israel and looking to Canada and looking to Netherlands and looking to Switzerland and looking to my country and Germany, etc., you are either fast or perfect. The fast countries have now a big coverage, but right now they are fighting with the authorities, like Israel, to some extent. The wannabe perfect countries, like my country, we have no problems with the INCB, we have no problems with anyone, we only have only 55 patients. So, uh, uh, I think that the perfect, and that this is, I'm not the first who says this, is the worst enemy of good and feasible and, 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 and realistic. So there should be always a compromise. There should be always a compromise which is based on the national environment and the national values. I think that the patients, without the direct input of patients, you are lost. I mean, you can't do this from above, right? I mean, there are countries where you can do it from the roots. This is not my country. We did it somehow from above. But again, I mean, the patients were extremely important. Um, the scientists, and that was another advantage in the Czech Republic, not only that the influential politicians somehow kept the message and, and, and tried to help, but we had the head of the Czech Medical Association being supportive, the head of the Czech Association for the Pain Treatment being supportive, only because they read the scientific literature, which some of the other people don't. Uh, it seems to me, in Israel, Canada and elsewhere, the people were somehow prepared for the political window. 
when it came. Being in a trial in Israel, being in a trial in Canada, being in the supportive political garniture in the Czech Republic or elsewhere, what I think is important is being prepared for it. I mean, the moment would come and you can help a little bit with education of the media people. So this is where I stop. This is the ICCI, the International Cannabis and Cannabinoids uh, Institute. Uh, here's its uh, web address. If there are medical students there, we might hire during the summer and autumn PhD and postdocs for projects. So feel free uh, to write me to this address. This is the Charles University. This is my address of the, wearing the hat of the medical uh, of the Ministry of Health and uh, save the date. There was the first year of the conference uh, one year ago. There will be another one. It was successful. This will be even better. And uh, there's the address where you can see. Uh, the presentation, including the stolen part uh, uh, by Lumir, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zabrinsky, for this uh, presentation that can be taken as a recipe for change. Uh, and if I may, I would like to ask the first question now. If you could highlight any uh, specifics to post-Soviet countries from this way. Because you know Hungary and Czech yeah. Republic are post-Soviet countries, both socialist countries. And there are some specifics that uh, yeah. apply to our countries that doesn't apply to others. Uh, I mean, I, will, I, I was speaking about these different types of, of, of the change. And I, and I think that in the post-Soviet, uh, well, actually are not post-Soviet, post-communist or post-real socialism or whatever, all the labels for being non-democratic were, uh, I, I think that because of our heritage, it's probably impossible to have this brave activism making a change, as we saw it in the United States and Canada and Israel and elsewhere, that is not to wait for the legislators to make a change, but simply to behave the way how you feel that's correct. I think that after 40 years, our activists are a little bit different. I mean, you know, uh, like we are activists, but uh, if we can pay by this, uh, whatever. If, if we were allowed to be activists or if there's a little bit less risk than the activists in the countries with more democratic, with longer democratic experience do have. So, 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 so I think that's the main issue. I mean, I mean, Israel didn't wait for Knesset allowing the medical cannabis. Canada didn't wait for the parliament for allowing this. I mean, the same for the United States, where even the states actually said to the federal government, Take care for your own business, okay? So this is not as much I can understand my part of the world actually pretty much realistic. So, uh, so we need to work with the politicians in the media much more. This is nothing against the activists, but I don't know about any cannabis social club in the post-communist countries. There's a number of them around. 